they say that money makes the world go around and those that have money have power, but I truly disagree with that. People who have food have power. Because at the end of the day, when it comes to it, if there was no value in money anymore, we would all still need to eat to live. And I believe that I've used that power in a positive way. So I have access to a lot of food, a lot of people need access to it. And we now provide a very inclusive way of people getting access to it. Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tingsa. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out, the kind that both employees and customers love and support. Thanks to Simply for sponsoring this episode as our partner of the show. We have joined forces because we wanted to celebrate the reopening of society and the industry. And we believe that we as an industry need to find new ways to become even more innovative from how we lead our people, how we operate and grow our businesses, to how we serve our customers. We wanted to share strategies and tools that can make the industry thrive long term, not just survive. This week we'll be taking a deep dive into a global problem, but also a very known problem on a food and drinks operator's P&L, food waste. And did you know that over 1.3 billion tons of food produced globally is lost and wasted every year? And if one fourth of this was saved, it would be enough to feed 870 million hungry people. For this conversation, I am talking with Adam Smith, who is the founder of the Real Junk Food Project, who is on a mission to solve the problem. Adam and his team are tackling food waste every day and have created a movement that feeds bellies, not just bins. I connected with uh, Adam directly from their warehouse where him and his team are distributing food to people in need, food that would else have been thrown out or wasted. We dive into why the word kindness is so important for him and his team. And he explains that it's so important that we start being kind to ourselves first because then we can actually start solving bigger problems of the world. We talk about his learnings around getting the right people in the right seat and how to understand your own limitations as the founder of a business. He underlines the importance of a founder being able to work on the business and not in it, and how you must be able to give your people permission to operate. He shares how he as a leader had developed himself a lot over the years, and he shares inflection points of his journey, from almost taking his own life, reinventing the business totally, and how to find ways to get himself in a more balanced state. Before you tune in, please sign up to our weekly newsletter on hospitalitymavericks.com, packed with more Maverick insights and strategies and tools. Now, please grab notebook, pen and coffee. This conversation will get your eyes open to a huge challenge we have around food waste, but also give you great insight into how you build an organization from the inside out by putting people first. Enjoy. You're on an incredible journey, and I can't wait to, to dive into it here. But I think we need to start somewhere else because uh, when we you start to uh, to look into you and study you a bit closer, I found a word called kindness on everywhere, on the logo, in everything almost you say or every talk you do, you talk about kindness. What does kindness mean for you and your team? Well, kindness came about due to a negative situation that happened within the Real Jumper project. And I won't dwell on that too much because it's not really um, within the public eye right now. But it was around 2017, 2018, where the project wasn't really heading in the direction that I had hoped for it. And there was, unfortunately, quite a lot of toxic behavior and characters within the project. So I kind of restarted the project again through uh, removing myself from one of the companies that I founded and restarted it and the way that we restarted it was for a collaboration with another organization where we just basically fed i think it's around 2,000 people with food and um for free in a, in a beautiful location in halifax uh in in uh, yorkshire west yorkshire and they they had these massive letters these big huge white letters just saying the word kindness and you can go online, you can look at it, and there's some incredible photos of this beautiful piece of architecture, this beautiful building, thousands of people, 
and these big glistening white letters just saying the word kindness. And I just thought about it for a long time and thought the world isn't kind to itself right now. And, you know, we've gone through a lot of issues around Brexit. We've got things like the Black Lives Matters movement. There's a lot of division within society, within politics, and, you know, even in environmental climate change issues, there's a lot of division. And I felt like the word kindness was being used in the wrong context. I thought a lot of people were talking about being kind to one another. And I obviously have to go through a lot of the issues that we're going to talk about with it, mental health issues. I felt like kindness should first and foremost be about how we are kind to ourselves. And as you mentioned in that quote, allow yourself to think and dream in unlimited ways. The kindness part of that is the allow yourself. Do we have the capacity to allow ourselves to deal with conflict resolution, to accept that we're not always right, to remove our ego from the equation, to be good to ourselves and to be good to other people. And I think first and foremost, if we can be kind to ourselves, then I think naturally we will be kind to one another. And so for us, the word kindness basically epitomizes how we treat uh, the staff, the volunteers, how we treat the planet. And But it all starts with ourselves and it's a constant reinforcing ourselves around being kind to yourself. And that means things like we pay ourselves a living wage, we take more time off, you know, we give ourselves a big holiday period, we have a four-day working week that we're trying to implement a much more cooperative approach to employment and decision-making, no hierarchy, and also about how we treat uh, each other within that space as well. So it's a very, very diverse community of people that come together to be part of the Real Junker Project. So for me, kindness is me, you know, I meet people from all over the world at this kindness warehouse and they come and take pictures and like, oh, I've got the kindness logo behind me and the Real Junk Project logo. And I constantly have to remind them that this isn't about being kind to each other on the planet. It's about being kind to yourself. And it gets them thinking a very, very different way. Because first and foremost, you start thinking, what parts of me are not kind? What parts of me are not kind to myself? And what things do I have to improve and work on and get better at? And then that's when you start to work on your interactions with other people and your interactions with the planet. It's only when that we get to that stage that we can start maybe improving our, our way of life. So interesting when you say that, Adam, because it always starts with with you uh, in everything. And actually, uh, uh, the year we've just gone through, uh, I've met, I've talked with a lot of people the last three months where actually uh, taking care of themselves or being kind to yourself is the last thing they have done. They just kept on trying to be, you know, stretch the boundaries. And and they're not really having the, the progress, as you say. They flatline almost uh, here as a business leaders, as family members. Everything comes out of balance because you're not trying to be kind to yourself and stop up and give yourself that time. And I, I, I'm including myself. I was there as well. And I think it was November I started to reflect about how do I actually get, you know, I, at that point, I just said, I just need more balance. I actually need to stop doing things. And that's how you can be kind to yourself as well and focusing on the few things that really matters and make impact. Um, what What about, uh, you talked about uh, the uh, happiness in another thing I uh, I, I studied you on. And, and you have a, a very different angle on happiness because we're all pursuing this happiness in life. And happiness is also something that that you have a very clear opinion about. What is your what is your uh, ideology around happiness? So yeah, I, I struggle with it because of the recent kind of diagnosis with autism. Um, fundamentally, not understanding what happiness is because I never feel happy or sad. Um, I'm on a constant the whole time, and I feel like. For me, happiness is the way that I engage with other people and seeing their reactions rather than how it makes me actually feel. So in fact, I've just been asked a question earlier today about how and why do you do what you do? What gets you up in the morning? What? Why do you keep doing this? Why do you keep putting this energy into this thing? And it's because it's infectious, doing the right thing, giving back, seeing people's reactions, providing people with food doing things above and beyond and being kind is infectious and that's what makes other people happy um, and therefore I feel like that's the thing that I should be doing um, whether I understand the emotional attachment to it or not is irrelevant because I can see the impact that it's having on other people's lives and I feel like if somebody like me who 
misunderstands and misinterprets emotions is able to give back and improve people's lives through the simple actions that I have taken, then it must be surely easier for those that understand it better to be able to be uh, prov provide people with happiness in their lives. And for me, I see the world in a very black and white way, either it is or it isn't. And the grey areas in between, which there's lots of them, I really, really struggle with. And um, I think I've managed to kind of somehow, <laughs> excuse me, deal with my incapabilities of understanding emotions in people, reading people's faces, understanding sarcasm, all those kind of things, um, and, and apply that in a way which I feel is uh, logical uh, and, and a much more kind of black and white way. And yeah, for me, I don't experience happiness. I just see the impact it has on other people's lives. I guess that some people would like to have that ability to actually you know, uh, either either it, either either it works or it doesn't work. We always, you know, in this emotional where we have to deal with these emotion and read them in a way that it, it's maybe also a very positive skill you have. Have you have you noticed that sometimes, especially when you you run a project like you do here, where there is a lot of you know a lot of moving parts and a lot of emotion, a lot of opinions. Yeah, I think the best way of summing it up is one of my volunteers said. There's two types of people on the planet. There's people that empathize, and you know, if there's an emotional situation, there's people that will put your arm around you and console you. And there's people like me that will just say, get on with it. And I think we need both types of people in the world. We need the empathizers. We need the people that will put your arm around you and emotionally console you. We need the people that can also crack on with it. And I think there's space in the, on this planet for both types of people. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the latter. I'm the guy that says, just get on with it, you know, you know. And in, in, in I guess, it's probably something that is more more and more recognized in people who are leaders and CEOs and founders and innovators because you've got, you've always, you know, I remember growing up and remembering the term uh, ruthless businessmen, you know, and people that were making ruthless decisions, you know, the Sir Alan Sugars of the world. And there's probably elements of like the autism uh, spectrum in some of these people who remove the emotional attachment out of it and are able just to kind of apply uh, logical answers to things and sometimes especially when you watch it on these tv programs a lot of people get emotionally involved in these characters and these people and they feel like the decisions that are being made are potentially sometimes harsh but from my point of view i go well that's the logical thing to do that doesn't work therefore let's try it a different way or let's move on so i believe that there are probably positives that i've taken out of it which has allowed me to be in the position that i'm in it does help uh, being somebody in the position that i'm in to be able to make those decisions, remove the emotion out of the equation, and to also be able to move on to uh, take risks as well, I think is another one. But there's obviously lots of downfalls of it as well. So conflict resolution, uh, reten retention of people, you know, because there, there was originally when I first started the project a very, very high turnover of people. People would come on board, say, I want to help out. Next minute, they wasn't happy with something, said they want to leave, and I just let them leave and say, right, another person I'll just walk through the door and I'll just, you know, they want to help out, so I'll get them to do something. And it was only like in the last couple of years that I had to really work on kind of people management skills, conflict resolution, removing that ego out of the equation as well, which I think is really important for somebody in my position. And um, so I understand how parts of the traits of the being on the spectrum are, are fundamental and sometimes crucial for people in those positions that have to make those key strategic, financial and legal decisions. Um but I've really, really had to work on and I've struggled a lot in the past with some of the emotional stuff that I don't have uh, in my kind of vocabulary as such uh, or in my ammunition and that other people probably see much easier to be able to apply. Have you then uh, got people on the team that can cover those areas for you and actually maybe guide you as a founder CEO? Absolutely. I think uh, Stephen Jobs said, the, said it the best where he says, you know, you should hire people that can do the job better than you can. Um, and, I, and I took that literally and I went out and did that. And so we have people that work in our financial teams that can do things that I don't even understand. We have people that work in HR that are really, really great with people, um, really great at coordination and uh, people management skills. We have uh, people that are great with uh, relationships and, and uh, global supply chain issues and, you know, people that work in warehouses that are much more organized than I am. And I just felt like, I could be the person they wanted me to be, uh, that people assumed I was, 
and probably go out and do the things like I'm doing with yourself today, whilst the organisation is run by people who care and passionate about it, who can do the job better than I can. Um, and I can support them in their role much better and, and, and uh, invest in them as people uh, much better if I was able to do that rather than trying to run everything myself. It's a really interesting, uh, you know, uh, organization you have because you said at some point, I'm not creating a, a charity. I'm, I'm build, uh, building a business so I can make real impact. Can you tell the, the audience about, you know, that doesn't know about what kind of scale the business is now, the journey you've been on and, and the journey you had yourself prior to that that led to starting the business? Yeah, well, the business uh, chronologically basically started in 2013 as a single cafe in Leeds. Um, after after the back of a lot of media exposure in 2014, uh, that grew. And at the height of 2016, we had 126 projects in seven countries worldwide, which was all connected autonomously through this very uh, simple partnership agreement which allowed them to use the name and the model and the kind of principles behind what we try to do in terms of the circular economy model. And uh, giving people, especially strangers, uh, too much autonomy um, basically imploded on us and we, we, we suffered the consequences of that, um, you know, taking liability for people we were not aware of and organisations doing things that we were not uh, entirely in control of. So although it had its good points and it grew and it exploded very, very quickly, it also then um, imploded. So we downscaled and we kind of devolved slightly to the point where we're at now, where we're in a 15,000 square foot warehouse, which redistributes and intercepts food on a national and international level. So we're able to do the work that the network was doing previously, but in a much more kind of controlled fashion. It's also very, very um, attractive for people to work with us in that sense, because we've got a little bit more control and autonomy over uh, the decisions that we make and we also make sure that any issues around food safety um, logistics issues decision making can all be done in-house rather than passing it on to another organization who may or may not um, have the same processes in place that we have so yeah we've now got to a stage where we're feeding you know uh, i think last year we did 1500 tons of food in this warehouse in leeds we only opened it in july uh, during the pandemic went from four members of staff to 20 something members of staff, I think it is. And I think the maximum we've got now is around 350 volunteers. And um, that was the equivalent of around three and a half to four million meals a year that we started to intercept, which was like nearly double the biggest year we'd done previously as an entire network as well. So um, as a single organization doing things better than what we were doing previously, we were able to do much more and be more productive and get access to much more food. And also the, the, the pandemic uh, accelerated a lot of that as well in terms of access to the food and uh, the, the scale of the growth as well. But then personally, myself, um, you know, I started the project back in 2013. Uh, I, I got the idea whilst working on a farm in Australia. And uh, prior to that, I uh, 10 years ago, pretty much now to the day, I was uh, I'd suffered a very serious suicide attempt. And... 15 years prior to that, I'd gone through a lot of abuse and trauma and uh, institutionalised into care, remanded into prison, uh, sectioned into mental health hospitals, suffered substance abuse. Um, there's pretty much nothing I haven't been through as a child all the way from the age of like 10 years old, right up until that moment when I was 25, when I was uh, assumed dead in a car when I was found by the police. Um, Unfortunately, I, I, I survived and, and came round and decided to go to Australia to run away from all my problems and that's obviously when I started to work on myself a lot more and um, I opened up my eyes to you know a global community, uh, interacting with people from all over the world, which I think every single person on the planet should do. And you know, and I, I started to uh, find myself more still making mistakes, um, but not reacting or going down some of the dark paths that I was going down previously um, prior to the suicide attempt and making more efforts in terms of turning those situations around much more productively. So it's been quite a roller coaster uh, year, uh, sorry, life. <laughs> um, and, and even in this year alone, you know, we've, we've, we've accelerated our growth already in this year in terms of our forecast and our production. But 
We are now one of the fastest growing social enterprises in the UK. Um, we are dealing with volumes of food nobody has ever witnessed before. And we're trying to close the loop by putting much more infrastructure into our growing projects and by having a community farm on site so that we can start closing that loop a little bit more and start producing food using surplus food as waste into composting schemes so that we can then hopefully then have a massive impact on supply and demand and the way that we um, deal with waste and waste management of surplus food in the future. So, yeah, we're, I think mainly because of what we spoke about previously about the kind of situation and uh, the happiness and putting a lot more effort into working on myself, I, uh, I've effectively then become a better version of myself, which has allowed me to be a better CEO, a better father, um, and a better person to be around in a workplace because I'm not dealing with a lot of that trauma. And I'm still in therapy now. I go every two weeks to therapy. I put a lot of effort into going to that therapy. I think it's very, very important. I don't think you can ever dismiss the, the importance or the impact of what therapy has, especially if you've been through a lot of trauma. Um, and just constantly keep on working on some of the situations that I struggled with previously, which has allowed, I think, the company to be in a better position than it was previous to that. And I think the, the scale of the growth um, isn't a coincidence in regards to how much effort I put into trying to work on myself as a, as a, as a leader as well. It's very interesting that you, you tell you have this infliction point of a hardship where you almost killed yourself to you start a business to you again have to reinvent that business uh uh because you, you build a business that got got out of control and i think a lot of you know ceos founders feel these you know situation where they take a business to a certain level so either they plateaus or it goes so crazy they can't control it and suddenly the, the things that starts to happen because you you maybe trusted people you haven't put the right systems in place to to rein in the business um uh, do you think that uh, your early life uh, hard, hardship actually had helped you then uh, as you hit these things? Because a lot of people would have said, okay, that's it, you know, it's all melting down. I'm leaving the ship. Now Now I need to, to do something new because this is just too much. They, they were probably not like you have done, pick it up again and say, well, we'll have to find a different way of doing this because this is too important. Exactly. And I think throughout my entire life, I've always landed on my feet and found ways to survive and get to the next point in my life. Um, I think the best analogy I've ever come up with is it, it was my life was like a hammock and I was sat in this hammock and the strings that were attaching it to the trees, there was very, very few strings. And, uh, you know, I was very, very close to that final string being broken and for me to fall and, and crash and, um, you know, effectively die. That didn't happen and all I've done since then is just attach more strings to this hammock so that there's a much much wider safety net so that I feel comfortable um, in my personal life and also my professional life I'm putting a lot more kind of stability into my life and a lot more structure not just also as a, as a, as a, a person as a father but also in the organization as well and when you start to implement all that structure and you've got things to fall back on um, you get to a position where I think I'm at now, which is, uh, you know, one of the advice points that I probably am going to mention later, is I'm in a position now where I can step away from the organisation and the organisation can still fundamentally work. Obviously, I have a lot of passion and drive behind what goes on. And uh, there's a lot of things like, uh, for example, the podcast that I'm doing with you and the, the media stuff that I do as well, which brings a lot of attention to the project, and rightly so, and it gives it a lot of credit. But I'm able to sit in this room with you today and, and speak to you whilst the organization can still stand on its own two feet and it doesn't need Adam Smith to run it. And I think that's fundamentally one of the key things that I've tried to put in place, even though at the, at the point of where I had to kind of rejuvenate the project, is to really, really focus on how I could remove myself from the equation. Because it was never the second time round uh, going to be seen as a sustainable organization that looks attractive to work with if Adam Smith was running around doing all the work and burning himself out effectively and I think that's something that I've recognized in lots of other people in similar positions to me and something that I massively advise on uh, when it comes to discussing um, issues around how the organization can be sustained and how you can sustain yourself as well. What is uh, then for, for this incredible venture what is uh, the next step right now Adam because you you now you have reset the the organization you're on a new path but is, is it with the same ambition to, 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 to conquer the world and share the model across the world? Because 
I guess it's a different delivery model than than before as well. So it, it's maybe more scalable. I don't know if that's correctly understood. Yeah, um, it is much more scalable now than it has been before. A lot of it will be done internally, so there'll be internal growth in order to cover the areas where there's gaps. Um, there'll be less of a kind of an autonomous franchise, I think is the best way to describe it. Um, obviously, a lot more investment into people. But from day one, when I started the Real Jumper project back in 2013, we set out to feed the world, and that hasn't changed. And, you know, we, we, we will all passionately run forward together alongside one another trying to achieve that goal uh, and that isn't us stood there with a giant pot of stew feeding lots of people in need that's us educating the world around the issues of, of food waste exposing the problem and working and collaborating with other people and organizations to try and come up with much more responsible and sustainable solutions of how we access and produce and manage our waste um, across the world and i think the model that we've got now uh, the streamlined version of what we do uh, it's much more effective, um, it has greater output, it has greater impact, it allows us to turn over food much quicker, reduce our waste, and it allows us to do the thing, the very thing that we set out to do from day one, which was what you mentioned earlier, is to feed bellies and not things. I know you have a background uh, as a chef, if I've, I've, I've picked up correctly. Is there still, uh, you know, you, you started out with the cafes, is that still part of, of the dream to, to go back and revisit that and see how you can... You can create a community uh, businesses like that that uh, will create local jobs, but also will help feed people that maybe can't afford you no know, going to a normal cafe or just people can come and support. Yeah, absolutely. I think obviously COVID has had a massive impact on the hospitality industry. And during that time frame, we built a lot of infrastructure around what we want to do going forward out of COVID. Uh, one of our three main operations uh, is catering. And we do a lot of outside catering, so we cater for lots of private events, weddings, uh, buffets, conferences, using surplus food, but with an environmental message behind it. So rather than it just being like a cheap caterer, we're actually there because people care about doing the right thing and being part of the solution rather than the problem. And then obviously, like you mentioned with the cafes, instead of going forward and taking on the liabilities of the premises and the rates and the utilities and all the things that come with that, we would like to collaborate much more with existing premises and existing organizations and utilize these spaces better uh, in, a, in a collaborative manner, um, using the page field concept, but trying to tap into the current footfall within the respective organization. So the next cafe we open up, which will be in Leeds, um, is in collaboration with an indoor skate park. Uh, they already have a huge footfall of customers. They've got an empty kitchen space. We'll go in and utilize that kitchen space and collaboratively we'll come together to feed uh, the community that they support whilst also providing for the local community and just providing people with much more nutritious access to food with the obviously the education behind the environmental issues of the produce that we use so the aim is is that we can do this much smarter than we did before and um, covid has unfortunately had an impact on the hospitality industry which means there's much more available kitchen space out there at the moment um, and we want to utilize those spaces in a manner that supports us uh, doesn't doesn't mean we have to take on any kind of financial burdens uh, or liabilities and uh, to support the existing organization that we have and give them some kudos bring some people to their to their table and obviously then we can provide the food and i think that seems to be the model that we're going to look at coming out of covid and much more collaborative effect when it comes to hospitality and catering super interesting so so the, so the big question here is uh adam uh, how are we gonna stop hunger you know the if we just talk uh, we, we talk about the world that's your your big b hack your ambitious goal but what about uh, if we just said let's stop hunger in the uk we've just gone through the pandemic there has been you know kids that couldn't get fed uh, uh during their holidays we have a uh, you know if you go to certain areas of the uk especially in the northern part where you're about i've been traveling and working a lot up there and i originally from denmark i actually got shocked about the difference that can be in quality of life and actually access to to proper food which you think is a human right in the western world but if we just said we had, you had to stop food food and hunger here in the uk what, what do we need to do what is it that we need to change what is your message well first and foremost i have nothing to do with poverty we are an environmental charity that stops food waste from an environmental perspective Poverty is a very social uh, issue and it's nothing to do with anything that we want. If we wanted to stop food waste, it's a collaborative effort between lots of different stakeholders 
between a very, very complex supply chain, which starts all the way from production and ends up with uh, retail and uh, wholesale and household. And every single sector in that supply chain has a different role to play because there isn't one simple answer. You can't just say, let's get rid of best before dates and that stops food waste because then you've got cosmetic standards and overproduction and you've got hospitality waste and there's so many different factors involved. When it comes to hunger, it's a very, very simple message. If politicians wanted to end hunger, they could do it tomorrow. They could just make a simple decision and it stops. It's as simple as that. Hunger is a social issue. It is affected by our politicians. We saw this during COVID when all of a sudden lockdown, the initial lockdown back in March and April 2020, homelessness was eradicated overnight. And now it's back again, probably even worse than what it ever was. So we know that the politicians can make these very, very simple decisions, but they choose not to. When it comes to food waste, it's an environmental issue. It's something we're going to have to do as a global community together to try and come up with much more responsible, sustainable, seasonal solutions to tackling lots and lots of different variables within that supply chain. If there's no simple answer to it. But, you know, I truly believe that there's people that need poverty to exist in order to profit from it. I believe that there are people out there that invest in plastering over the cracks rather than dealing with the root cause. And um, there is absolutely no reason in a supply chain in a very, very uh, affluent country such as, uh, such as the UK that there should be anybody going without because it's a, it's a paradox that we overproduce and we also waste when there are people that go without food. And that's a paradox and therefore it shouldn't exist and it does exist. And some of those answers um, are going to have to come straight from the people at the top who can make these decisions. I believe they choose to make the wrong decisions. And unfortunately, as we both know, especially in the north of the UK, especially in some of the more working class towns and cities across the north of the UK, there are probably millions and millions of people who are not accessing their basic human rights um, because of decisions that are made in central government. And for me, that is a very, very simple answer. Politicians make those decisions, not us. They cannot do anything around food waste, but they certainly can stop hunger. And then just to, to add to what you just said, Adam, one, one of the things I did a podcast uh, last year, a little series about uh, hospitality and the Infinity Game. It's about long-term thinking, about doing the right things for, for people, communities, and the planet. And one of the things we were talking about in one of the episodes uh, was uh, No no Planet B. There's a book called No Planet B. And the fact is that we produce about 5,000 calories per person living on this earth every day. And we only need about 2,000 to be well fed. And the rest is waste. And that's shocking. That When I read that book probably four or five years uh, time ago, the first time, uh, I was like, wow, okay, this... I, I knew there was a food waste problem from being in hospitality. I just have stopped that so many times myself in operations, but I didn't know it was that scale. And that's what people have to understand is the, the amount of food we produce right now per human on the planet and actually how many hungry people there is, is crazy. Yeah, but the two are not related because you have overproduction and you have waste. And overproduction of the calories that like you mentioned then, the, the calorific growth of food in the world right now a lot of those calories are diverted towards livestock. So there's a lot of animals that are accessing those calories before humans do. And then those animals are slaughtered, those animals are put into plastic, and then they're shipped all over the world. And we do not consume that much in terms of calories when it comes to animal protein, and then it's wasted. So you've got the element of waste additionally to the element of overproduction. And then, to add to the paradox further, you have people that go without. Now, the stats are, which are completely fabricated, um, one billion tons of food is wasted on the planet worldwide every year, and over a billion people don't have the basic access to food. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the way that I see the world is very black and white. Well, if you've got a billion tons of food going to waste and you've got a billion people that go without, surely just connect the two together and, and, and plug that gap. You know, there's surely there's a logical uh, solution to that. Obviously, there isn't. There's a lot of different variables involved and players involved in that, in that game. But... It, it doesn't make any sense. Like we talk about the changes of diets. We patronize people for eating animal protein. We're constantly pointing fingers at who should and shouldn't be eating what. But nobody stops to think about how much we actually waste. And I think before we start talking to people about what they should and shouldn't be eating and patronizing them about their calorific intake and you know whether they're vegan or whether they eat meat, 
we need to start looking at how much we actually waste first, tackling the issues around waste before we start looking at the reasons of, of why people choose to eat what they eat. Because fundamentally, we will destroy the planet and ourselves if we continue to overproduce and waste as much as we do before we start to change our diets dramatically that will have an impact on climate change. So we, we, we live in a paradox, you know, and, and uh, you cannot come out of uh, um, a, a pandemic continuously living in a paradox and expect positive outcomes, um, especially when it comes to climate change, because planet Earth will balance itself out in some way, shape or form. And I think both of us understand this, but I see it on a daily basis. All you have to do is switch the TV on, and there are things happening on this planet right now now that are not normal. Uh, weather, uh, you know, the way that animals are depleted all over the world, from fish stocks to animals going extinct. There are things happening at a much, much alarming rate than ever before, and it's to do with the fact that we live in this paradox. We cut down trees to raise animals, to put them into plastic, ship them across the world, dump them in the ground because we don't need them. And then the only thing that can counteract that emission is the trees that we're cutting down. And it's this vicious circle of paradoxical approach to food that we need to stop. And luckily, COVID highlighted a lot of that for us. And I just hope that we take the opportunity of coming out of this pandemic to actually start thinking of ways that we could do things better. I think you're absolutely right. Mother Earth has given us a bit of a warning what she is able to do. She will find a way to balance out without the, the sapiens on, on the on the on the earth. We just need to stop doing what we're doing. It's as simple as that. Very, very true, Adam. And uh, very well uh, explained as well about, you know, the insanity of how we move food around the planet for, for no use at all. What about uh, you? Uh, going through this journey, is there anything you would have liked to have known in before 2013? Uh, is there something where you think, oh, I would have loved to know that because that would actually have made me to be in a in a better position today. And what is that thing? And what 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 was that learning you got from that? I think you know hindsight is a beautiful thing, and we'd all like to go back and uh, maybe do things differently or change the way we approach things or even apply what we've learned now. But I think, you know, I'm, I'm a forward thinking person. I'm always looking to the future. And I think it's not always the most positive way of uh, approaching things because who knows what may happen? You know, all you've got to do is uh, look at the films like Butterfly Effect and, you know, all these films where people go back in time and how it changes the path going forward. I just think it's a really, really dangerous kind of rhetoric because I would love to go back and say, you know, invest in people and invest in human resource and make sure you've got a sound financial team to support you and apply infrastructure and um, don't speak to this person that way and don't react that way. But the reason that I'm here, I am today, speaking to you and, um, you know, you could classify it as a successful social enterprise is because I didn't do those things and I learned from those mistakes and then I put actions to make sure that it didn't happen again. And I think for me, that is something I would probably go back and say to myself is always keep learning. No matter what, you do not know all the answers. You will learn every single day new things. Listen to people. Uh, don't speak to people uh, with the intention to uh, reply to them. You know, li Listen to them and, and, and absorb what they're saying and interact with people because you know, we don't all know the answers and we've all got different ways of thinking and we've all got different ways that we've been nurtured and, and natured in this world. And, you know, it's, it's the great, the great uh, picture that you can, you know, you can find this online is uh, the number six written on the floor. And if somebody looks at it one way, it says the number nine. If somebody looks at the other way, it's the number six. And both people are right. Um, it just depends on how you look at things. And I think that's something I had to really fundamentally drill into myself is that even though I see the world in a black and white way, there are people that don't. There are people that probably don't understand me, and I definitely don't understand them. But that doesn't mean either of us are right or wrong. And I think that's maybe something that we could apply to ourselves in society as well, especially when it comes to, and you probably know this better than I do, Michael, actually, is because when I traveled the world, I realized that in the UK especially, we are very immature when it comes to debating. And I think Brexit and Black Lives Matter has absolutely shown how Things that we don't necessarily agree on have divided us so so polarized 
Whereas if you try, I traveled around Europe and I traveled across Australia and South Asia, and you see the level of maturity that people can have debates, open and honest discussions, and respecting and understanding people's differences in, in opinion, and, and fundamentally still being friends whilst having differences and difference in opinion. You can't do that in the UK. You know, you either believe in let it leave or you let you remain it. And that was it. And it was like, well, what about if I think that there's a good thing from both sides? Like, and I just think that maybe we need to, need to mature a little bit as a society um, so that we can start having much better conflict resolution and debates and open and honesty around things that divide us so much as a society. But fundamentally, we can all still go outside of our doors and still function as a, as a race and we can still go to work and we can still travel and we can still go on holiday and do all the things that we were doing before. But we just have a difference in opinion. And I don't think that that should be the case. I think we need to start looking at ways of how we uh, respect one another's opinions more. And that's the thing that I had to work on You know, a lot is I am not always right. I am definitely not always right. And I had to respect that just just because I founded an organization that's seen as radical and seen as something that's having a much revolutionary approach into the food system, that um, there are going to be people that disagree with me and there are going to be people that have better ideas than me. And I've got to respect them and uh, still focus on what I'm doing and somehow embrace those differences. Um, and I think that's something that we can all learn as well as a, as a society. It's super interesting what you said because it is a lot in this conversation. You come back to mindset and how you approach life and how you learn from your mistakes and failures. What about uh, is there like some people that really have inspired you on this journey to actually to become the person you are? And you talk a lot about you have to become a better version of yourself. Um, yeah, I speak to my therapist about this a lot, and it used to be this um, notion of uh, grandiose, you know, of always thinking I was going to be this global world leader and you know never a millionaire but somebody with you know in a global capacity to, i think i've always had the mindset to think on a global level and therefore people who are in like elitist positions i always admire so um you know first and foremost david Attenborough, for example you know he's a massive massive inspiration to me i think somebody who's altruistically given back to the entire planet who's seen things that none of us could even imagine and documented it and portrayed it in a way that every single person on the planet can understand. He is an incredible human being, and he cares so much about everything but himself. And I think that's a really, really important thing, especially in modern society and younger people these days, especially with the digital age, social media platforms, online bullying, all those kind of things. I think somebody like him still in our lives is, is fundamental and very important. But then people like, um, you know, I look up to people like Lewis Hamilton, for example, who. Um, you know, a young black male who is, is is an elitist sport and he has faced so much incredible negativity and yet he still has a level of integrity despite the fact that he probably suffered and you can probably tell in his professional timeline the point where maybe his ego got too much of him and he had to take a step back and work on himself a bit better and he's come with a very different approach now. And I think people that can do that... Um, are incredible because like you said earlier uh, about myself you know people that can have that um survival of the fittest and can approach things in a different manner but still lead in the same direction and accept that that the first way maybe wasn't the right way and potentially you know that they're going to try and do it a different way you know he also comes from a very working class background he's from stevenage so he probably has that installed into him anyway it's probably to do with a little bit of the upbringing um but throughout my life all those very controversial, negative areas like being in prison and being uh, in care, sectioned, um, or everything. There was always one person, uh, from a key worker to a friend to maybe even a family member, there was always one person at the time that I attached myself to. And that person got me to the next stage in my life. So I'd always had this capacity to survive and and surround myself with a good person or good people to give me give myself that stability uh, that i needed even though i was creating this very self-destructed and chaotic life so 
from an early age, it was mainly people around me. But as I've got older, I, I'm, I'm massively influenced through people that are purely altruistic. I mean, I, I quote a lot and I read up a lot on people like Rosa Parks. You know, if you imagine living in a world where the color of your skin determines if you can sit on a bus or not, uh, on where you sit and where you eat and how you interact with people, I couldn't even imagine what that must have been like or what that's still like to this day, even for some people of, of who are not white. I, I can imagine what was going through that woman's head, the impact that's had on us as a society, everything. It's an incredible thing that, that, that she did. And I just feel like if you're down on your knees and you're right at the depths and you've got the power to still do the right thing and make the right decisions, um, you know, those people are the ones that deserve all the credit and all the knighthoods and all the awards and accolades that people get. Um, I think it takes some real 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 serious deep down thinking and energy and belief uh, in whatever faith you have you know to do the right thing to be able to make those decisions and yeah that's the thing that inspires me people the most anybody that goes above and beyond i mean if you look recently the most recent uh, inspiration i've got is the i forget her name i think her surname is wolf is the girl who um set up the tinder and now she's set up the other dating uh, uh, agency called uh, bumblebee i think it's called or something along those lines and she was basically kicked out of her own organization. She's now one of the youngest CEOs uh, in the world, female CEOs in the world that's floated her company on the stock exchange. And she's also a mother as well. And I just think those people, I mean, Jacinda as well, the, the New Zealand prime minister, people like that who are just incredible, incredible uh, centrist people who can make incredible decisions, even whilst being a mother and all the pressures and stresses that come with that you know, to empower people locally to do the right thing, regardless of all the backlash that she received from across the world, uh, even from her own people, to make those incredible decisions. I just think that those people are incredibly inspirational uh, and incredibly empowering, and those are people that we should be holding in high regard and, uh, and, and using as influential characters to the next generation. Yeah, and I just want to say uh, thank you to the people that helped you uh, along the way because uh, or else we wouldn't have you here doing these incredible things today. So if you're listening in, thank you very much for helping Adam up the ladder of life. We all have these people, by the way. Absolutely. Uh, sometimes we just forget them a bit. On your everyday life, because you are you are a CEO founder in the front line, you're right now in the warehouse. Uh, you you said I want the, uh, no hierarchy. I will try to avoid that. Uh, I want people engage. How do you actually get the energy to show up? I call it show up pro every day and actually be in in the, in the right mindset to keep on driving this movement forward. What is it that you do? Do you have like some some habits? You know the, the you know some of the best in the world have these life habits they do every day and they're like a system for how they operate. I think fundamentally two really important things I, uh, I do. One is what I've mentioned earlier is that the project is very infectious. You know, when you give back and you provide to people that can improve their lives, especially when it comes to food and you see the impact it has on them and the way that it lifts their shoulders and all their burdens just by providing them with some food. It's one of the most empowering positions you can be in. And um you know, they say that money makes the world go around and those that have money have power, but I truly disagree with that. I don't believe that money has any power whatsoever. I think people who have food have power because at the end of the day, when it comes to it, if there was no value in money anymore, we would all still need to eat to live. And I believe that I've used that power in a positive way. So I have access to a lot of food. A lot of people need access to it. And we now provide a very inclusive way of people getting access to it. But also as well, something that we've touched on, which I think is fundamentally important, is that I've surrounded myself with really good people. So I know that I can come into a positive environment. I know that we can make decisions between us. I know that people feel empowered to do the right thing. Uh, we're very good at conflict resolution. Decisions are made without me always being involved, but always what's best for the organization. And I was inspired by uh, a man called Bob Gordon, who used to work for Nando's, the chain restaurant. And his position was doing the right thing manager. And every time he made a decision, he had to question whether it was the right thing or not. And I just thought that was an incredible uh, position to be in. Um, and we just decided that's what kind of we uh, approach that we were going to uh, implement in terms of our attitude. So every time we make a decision, we question, does this help stop food waste? And if it does, then we do it. And if it doesn't, then we don't do it. And 
it's just infectious, Michael. You know, it's 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 there's there's no trick or technique that I do. You know, I'm not doing yoga at five o'clock in the morning or jumping into ice baths or you know taking twenty four mile runs or anything like that. Um, I focused on working on myself better from a mental health perspective. I think next I really want to work on myself much more physically. So I changed my diet drastically to a much more plant-based diet so that I wouldn't have as much inflammation in my body. And, you know, I did a lot of work around nutrition and health. And that's my choice. You know, I don't patronize people for what they eat, but that's my choice. And it did have a positive impact on my body and on, on my mental health as well. And then I also, like I said, I, I surround myself with those good people so that I can have, and I think what's important, something we touched on earlier about the way that we um, debate with one another and conflict resolution and, and our maturity when it comes to uh, how we have polarized uh, through some of the changes in opinions. I think what's really important as well is I surrounded myself with people who don't always agree with me and are not always um, similar to myself because I think it's really important to get as many different points of view as possible. And I struggled with that massively. I really, really, really struggled with that. Because anybody that wasn't environmental and didn't want to save the planet, I just said, well, you know, stuff you then, you know, uh, you're not part of this. But, you know, I've even got people who are very right wing, kind of Tory voting, um, uh, non environmentally focused people who probably have some extremist views that are very different to the way that I think and uh, also support uh, issues that I believe shouldn't exist. And I've even surrounded myself with people like that who probably are not as much as aligned as people who are stereotypically uh, aligned with projects like ourselves, or maybe more left-wing thinking uh, people uh, who probably, you know, go more towards kind of the Green Party type feel. So I felt like instead of just surrounding myself with those type of people and creating echo chambers, I surrounded myself with lots of different types of people who are probably not aligned with my way of thinking and maybe the project's way of thinking because I needed as much input as possible to understand different points of views to be able to make decisions which was the best decisions for the planet and for people as possible without feeling like the way that I wanted to do things was right and um, because it's not. But I believe that fundamentally we can get to a place where we all agree and we all benefit um, and that's the drive and the passion that I have every day, every time I wake up and I come into work, is knowing that everybody has a voice, everybody has an opinion, and we're taking those opinions to try and put into place practices that we feel will benefit not only the planet, but as many people as possible. It's super interesting what you say there, Adam, because uh, when I uh, work with the, my own teams in the business I'm involved in or sit on a board or uh, advise people, I always talk about the right people on the bus in the right seats. Uh, and it doesn't mean that it's just a happy clappy. It means exactly that you can have healthy debates and you can be so disagreeing. The best teams I've been in, we widely disagree sometimes, but we come to a shared outcome in the end. And that's often a better solution if we just all said yes from the outset, because there's been some scrutinizing of that decision. And uh, so many teams don't have that element where they actually utilize each other's strengths and differences. And actually, that's one of the most important thing in a in a super engaged and a powerful team that has amazing outcomes. So uh, I think you're on the on the right track with that. And uh, sometimes you need to listen to 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 di- either point of view you feel you have feel very difficult about, but you can really learn something and actually understand their position and maybe actually draw them closer to you and what you want to do because you need to be the change that you want to see in the world as we discussed before the podcast and some of the things that have polarized us in terms of our uh, the decisions that we've made so things like black lives matter and, and brexit you know especially most recent times that have polarized us i think a lot of people on either side don't feel listened to and i think that's fundamentally the biggest problem it's not necessarily that we've got a difference in opinion is that they don't feel listened to so We've obviously exited uh, Europe as part of Brexit, and a lot of the people that voted to remain just didn't feel like they were listened to. And there's a lot of people that voted to exit that also felt like they were not listened to. And so this polarization fundamentally didn't even actually tackle any of the issues that both sides of the party uh, were disagreeing on, which is really, really important, like you said, you know, to feel listened to. Because we may have all gone, you know what, you're probably right, let's do this rather than the polarization that's happened, which has caused so much friction, especially in this country. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, uh, uh, Adam. We, we, we have talked now in, um, in this conversation about some, some huge 
challenges, some really global uh, challenges. Some of them are actually on the UN's uh, 17 goals of uh, to improve the world. Um, what 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 advice would you get to to leaders, CEO, founders like yourself out there, trying to make a better impact uh, on the world? What should they do right now if we want to to stop the the death spiral of what you discussed uh, earlier? I think there's an opportunity right now coming out of Brexit to be able to do things different to how we did them before. Not necessarily better, but definitely different. It might lead to things that are not right, but there's an opportunity. And I think in order to grasp that opportunity, we have to collaborate. We have to work with everybody, every stakeholder involved in those topics and those conversations to try to come up with different ways of doing things because we have got a beautiful opportunity here. And all you have to do, Michael, and I'm sure you were as aware, you know, if you look at some of the NASA photos of some of the hot spots of where the Earth was warming up, so very, very industrialized uh, countries and cities, and the fact that they stopped and how quickly the, the planet reverted back to the way that it was very quickly just goes to show us now that we don't need to set targets 35, 40 years in, in the future. We can set these targets from weeks, if not months, away where we can start to look at different ways of doing things which will have a much more positive impact on our planet, which will reduce the impacts of climate change and stop hastening that, that procedure going forward. And I just think these opportunities will allow us to develop a society to become much more abundant uh, in terms of everybody having access to our basic human rights, as we mentioned before. So I think, yeah, opportunities, collaboration especially, and uh, try to do things differently than we did before, um, because clearly what we were doing before was not positive. And it and, uh, didn't work as well. The outcomes we got was really, really bad. So that's some super advice there. Uh, a last question, Adam, before we go off, because you mentioned that you uh, you get inspired from different thinkers. Is there any book that uh, you would advise anyone to read right now? Or is there a book you would give away to people? Yes. Well, I'll plug my own book. Uh, I'm writing a book at the moment, which isn't being released, but I am writing a book. And hopefully it should be released this year, I hope. Um, there is a book that inspired me massively to think very differently about the world, and that was a book called Ecotopia written in the 1970s by a man called Ernest Callenbach. It's absolutely insane the amount of research this person must have done to come up with some of the solutions to the issues of climate change in the 1970s that we're only just now putting into place or discovering. Um, it's a work of fiction. It's not a, it's not a factual book. And basically, San Francisco revolutionizes and becomes independent from America. And the president at the time sends a reporter into this place, which is called Ecotopia, and they start to do things. I mean, I couldn't uh, stress enough just how different they do things. But they focus on the fundamentals of nurturing nature. So one of the one of the key things they do is um, they realise that when children are born, they instantly need uh, their mothers, and you know their attachments of mothers and that and that touch and. It's a much more social approach to childcare rather than uh, females struggling on their own. And it wasn't that there wasn't a role for men or males in that situation. It's just that at those instant uh, times of birth, that there was a much more kind of uh, motherly and, and maternal approach to it, a much more social approach of people supporting one another much more, which was really, really, really interesting in terms of how we uh, look at child development and um, interaction with children. And it was just really, really Silly things like um, they halved the working week and then doubled the workforce, so everybody had a job. But then you didn't have to go to work, and then people took up hobbies and skills and started to learn how to make crossbows and arrows and take up archery. And you know, because they had the time, people committed to art, and that was really, really interesting. And then what they did is another thing was is they dug up all the pipes from the ground, and obviously they had much more sustainable energy sources. And they dug up these huge pipes on the ground, which were not needed anymore to pass fossil fuels through and all the other things that they were passing through. And they created these like huts where they sectioned them off and created these little modular houses. So basically you didn't even need anywhere to live. You could just sleep at these one of these places and move on to the next one. And it was these really, really radical, extreme ways of dealing with a new world. In the 1970s, this guy wrote this. So you're talking like 50 years ago. Um, I don't know how he managed to come up with some of these things. 
but it made me to start thinking, especially around the project around, we have a very uh, tunnel vision approach to the future where we believe we've got to keep going in this direction. But what this guy said is like, he did things so dramatically different as a kind of social experiment that the reporter uh, who went in actually stayed and lived there and didn't go back and report back to the president because they were so embraced in this community. And there's another thing in there around like the Hunger Games approach. So the fact that test, men have testosterone and needed to get this testosterone out of themselves. So they have these like Hunger Games uh, every year kind of scenario, which is really interesting because the Hunger Games didn't actually come out until you know the last decade, which was much, much later than this book. But I think it was inspired by this book around how there is a need to invest in our hormones and our emotional activities in ways which are much more productive than maybe some of the things that we're doing now fundamentally in society. Um, there was no crime, you know, there was no there was no murders, there was no rape, there was no sexual assault, or nothing like that, because they fundamentally applied those things into everyday society so people could get out what they needed emotionally and from a hormonal perspective and then could function in everyday life as they see fit. And so it was really, really, really interesting how this guy had this approach to these radical ways of potentially doing things different, which seemed very radical at the time, but now probably seem like more like common sense. Um, and this was 1970s, Michael, I can't stress it enough. Like it's mental to think the amount of research he must have done. He talked about sustainable solutions, sustainable energy sources, greener ways of thinking. It was insane what he came up with. And, you know, food sources, so foraging, hunting, um, those kind of approaches to food rather than this mass-produced, uh, forced, factory farm style approach that we've got where we overproduce and waste. It was just, and people could eat animal protein if they foraged or hunted it themselves. Um, and I think that is a much, much, much more sustainable way of accessing um, sources of protein if that's what we decide to do, which doesn't have a detrimental impact on uh, the population, the biodiversity of uh, the species of different animals, but also about on our climate as well. Because as we've seen uh, more recently, the issues around climate change are having massive, massive impacts on wildlife. I think it was only a couple of days ago I was watching an article around um, how great white sharks have left the uh, the bays of South Africa now because of the rising temperature, which is having an impact on some of the metals in the water which is having an impact on the reproductive system of great white sharks, which is having a massive impact on the uh, populations of jellyfish and squid because they've now taken over everything, which means they've now become an invasive species. And it's like all we did was, uh, you know, burn the ozone layer, which has increased the temperature in the oceans, and that's had a huge impact on some of the most apex predators on this planet. And it was just incredible how much effort and energy this guy had put into a very, very short book fiction you know it's quite funny in places and really radical and extreme in others um but it got me to think about things very differently and going the only way that i can prove to people that there can be a different way of doing things is by actually going out and showing them and doing it and giving them the alternative so choose to be part of the solution or choose to be part of the problem and i think that's what i got out of the book so yes i if you are interested in climate change about fundamental radical solutions to our basic infrastructure of society then definitely go and look at that book, that book. yeah well I'm, I'm going on amazon afterwards because i haven't heard about that book actually i'm very interested in these kind of things and this and this sounds exactly as you say this is where we actually are going as a society with a shorter work week and and these thing and i hope i hope uh how some of his prophecies comes to true uh, because as you say we can just make a decision and change the world it's all up to us. We have all the powers as the, the humans on, on this planet. It's been absolutely fascinating, Adam, as I expected. You know, like uh, it's really inspiring what, what you're doing and what you're trying to, to, to give back, uh, giving more than you take, as I call it. It's beautiful, uh, deep, deep purpose I can feel. If people want to find out more about you, uh, Adam, but also the real uh, junk food project, where do they, uh, where do they go and find find you the, uh, i launched my website uh, so that's mrjunkfoodchef.com uh, you can find out about all my events that i do the catering some of the blogs around environmental issues you can book my time etc etc um trjfp.com is the website for the real junk food project and obviously we've all we've got social media channels that support that 
Um, and you can do all sorts of things on our website from purchasing a box of food to volunteering to accessing food on a national level to finding out about all the wonderful and weird and wacky ways that we deal with food and food waste um, and how I probably lead and drive a lot of that wackiness. Um, yeah, so both have websites, we both have social media channels um, and you can pretty much just Google us and, and you can find us. But if you do type in Adam Smith, then there is another Adam Smith, which is a little bit more popular and famous than I am that you may come across before you find me. So <laughs> just be careful you find the right Adam Smith. We, we, we'll make sure there's a links in the show notes so so you'll all be able to to find him out there adam thank you so much for for your time uh keep on uh adding positive things to the world and i send you and the team power energy and love to uh to move on through the next couple of years thank you i appreciate it very much adam. it's been a pleasure coming on i, I really appreciate it Thank you so much, Adam, for sharing your story and learnings about how to build a movement and a team that do good by feeding people in need and also having a positive impact on the planet. If you want to get more in touch on how to rethink the way businesses roll are in our society, please tune in to episode 52, Time for a New Business and Economic Paradigm with Tom Ribbon, the CEO and founder of On Purpose. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please share, rate, review, or subscribe to one of our channels. A big thank you to BizSimply for supporting us, bringing great insights and strategies and tools to help the industry thrive, not just survive. Check them out at bizsimply.com or visit them on their social at bizsimply or bizsimplyhq. And you can also email them directly on advice at bizsimply.com. Tune in next time for another interview and in the meantime, find out more about us and subscribe to our community and download free leadership tools at hospitalitymavericks.com. And don't worry, if you did not get all of this, there will be links in the show notes. Thanks for listening and be maverick.